welcome to Means and Methods, a series of interviews with faculty at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, where we talk about the ways that faculty do their research. My guest today is Dr. Sean Kohlberg, who is a theology professor here at St. Ben's and St. John's. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for joining us. Um, tell us what you're researching now. What are you working on? Well, um, my area of expertise is is what we call high scholastic or medieval theology. Um, so the high point in that is the 1200s, sort of the 13th century. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's marked especially by theologians like, like St. Thomas Aquinas or, or St. Bonaventure who were active in that period. Mm -hmm. There are periods, the early ancient period, the medieval period, the Reformation period, and the modern period, which become important. For me, I kind of probe that high scholastic period for the way in which it's receiving the ancient tradition mm -hmm. and the way then it's received into the Reformation and modern traditions. Part of what my research is about is sort of revisiting these figures to see how their influence shapes the ongoing conversation mm -hmm. about how religious thought unfolds. There's been a lot of classic research done that, you know, prior to the medieval period, most theology was done either in a monastery, mm -hmm. like a place like St. Ben's or St. John's, or in a cathedral school. Mm -hmm. um, but in the medieval period, what we see is the rise of modern universities. So, uh, for example, Para, the University of Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, University of Bologna. These are the first times we have kind of full freestanding schools. And at the heart of all of these schools, especially in the medieval period, is the study of theology. And so um, theology is done in a new way in the medieval period, which does mark a bit of a pivot from the ancient way. The ancient world would have been more contemplative. Mm -hmm. Theology would have been done in the context mm -hmm. of prayer and in the context of, uh, of uh, biblical commentaries and liturgical writings. Mm -hmm. uh, in the medieval period, we see a shift to something called the questio and the disputatio, uh, which stays with us till today. Um, theology is, becomes or is, is moved into a more speculative sphere where uh, the heart of Christian faith is put before uh, kind of probing questions for, for answers. So what are maybe some surprising things that you've uncovered in your recent research? So I've done, I just, just completed a book, it's forthcoming with uh, Catholic University of America Press on Aquinas and Bonaventure. And the argument there is that, the argument of the book is that uh, first and foremost these thinkers are biblical thinkers. Uh, one thing we have to remember about medieval theologians is that doing theology was sort of their secondary work. Their primary work was pastoring, preaching, mm -hmm. working with, uh, working in their in their own friaries or in their own monasteries, uh, and then doing the work of evangelization and and um, and pastoring with people. And what part of I want to argue in the book is that it's this regular work that informs their theological work. And so I'm making an interesting argument that sort of runs against some of the classic scholarship that Aquinas and Bonaventure understand human salvation from a much more scriptural standpoint than they've maybe been given credit for in the past. You know, for example, Thomas and Bonaventure were both mendicants, uh, meaning they were um, belonging to these new religious orders who lived outside of monastic walls and um, who took vows of poverty very seriously. Uh, just as an example, neither Thomas nor Bonaventure rode a horse. Uh, and to just kind of put that in perspective, uh, St. Thomas taught in Paris and in Naples and in Orvieto and then back in Paris. And to think about that, that means that he, that he walked to those places. He walked over the Alps from <laughs> Paris and not on a super highway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and what I, what, the reason I just um, bring that up is that he's very much an embodied theologian who... Uh, spends much more time walking places and thinking about creation and thinking about yeah. the life cycle, the paschal mystery, than he does sitting in a classroom. Uh, and so that knowledge comes back into their theology in a very organic and life-giving way. Uh, what would you really like for people to know about your work? Why, uh, why is it so important for you to pursue this line of thought? The first is, um, you know, I grew up in a small town here in Minnesota, thousand people, the majority of whom were Lutheran, and I grew up uh, as, a, as a Catholic in that town, and it became clear to me even as a child that uh, dialogue amongst people with uh, religious or theological differences 
was very important. Um, and so most of my interest in medieval and Reformation theology arises out of modern questions. Uh, and I do see most of my work, um, while I love to sit and read Aquinas all day, most of my work is oriented toward modern questions, which are primarily about um, how do people of diverse Christian backgrounds and diverse non-Christian backgrounds, for me, my own area of expertise is how do Protestants and Catholics um, talk about their differences. And an important way to do that is to bring these figures into the conversation. One, so that we can understand them as these fully embodied, not disembodied human beings. Mm -hmm. But secondly, so we can see what they actually have to say. You're working away at your manuscript. Early morning, are you an early bird or an, a night owl? A night owl for sure. Night owl for sure. Um, the later the better. Working at home, in your office, someplace else? As the daughter of a couple of young girls, uh, it's wherever uh, I get a, a moment's peace. Usually it's at home, but oftentimes at Starbucks. So many of my students will see me there. <laughs> my headphones on, head down. Um, they usually have my drink made before I walk in. But also here in, the, in Alcoin, I do enjoy some time too. And you mentioned your sources earlier, but if you have a choice, an ebook or a print book? So far, print. Mm -hmm. uh, these days, though, I do enjoy the accessibility of an ebook. That's nice. That's really nice. And when you're actually working on your manuscript, on your laptop or paper and pencil? That's a laptop. Oh, I, and, and I am a don't move on from the sentence until it's right kind of guy. I'm guessing that your fuel of choice is going to be coffee. I don't drink it. It stunts your growth. I, uh, I am an iced tea drinker with the free refill uh, <laughs> with my Starbucks no. card. <laughs> and the last question, what do you read for fun? Oh, that's a little embarrassing. Lately I've been reading um, uh, Philip Kerr's Bernie Gunther novels, okay. uh, which are so enjoyable. Right. We easy. all need a, a place to just park our brains for a while. So it's... If I had to pick a little more interesting book, William Kent Kruger's um, oh. Amazing Grace and the second mm -hmm. one he's got coming out, mm -hmm. sort of got all of that beautiful beauty of a novel in it still, but a little deeper in terms of its thinking about the human condition. Yeah. And a Minnesota author to boot. That's right. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for listening in on this conversation, and we'll have more to come. Thanks. Thanks.